peace. To the Church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be holy, together with all others everywhere, who called on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I, have, uh, I always thank God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way, in all your speaking and in all your knowledge, because our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you. Therefore you do not lack any spiritual guilt as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will keep you strong to the end. And you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God who has called you into fellowship with his Son Jesus Christ, our Lord, is a So then men ought to regard us as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the secret things of God. Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait till the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of men's heart. At that time, each will receive his praise from God. So be it. For Stephen, Ron, and Gone, down yeah. south. No, they went on a train ride to the falls. Uh, when do they leave to go down south? In um, in a little under two weeks. Okay. <clears throat> so I four weeks. Well, then it'll be gone four weeks. So I assume there's no children's church today. Not today. But you're going to take over when they're gone. Somebody. Uh, somebody. Else. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for the sunshine. We thank you for the beautiful fall colors. It's such a beautiful time of year. And we know that with death comes life because of Jesus Christ. That we know that next spring we'll have the beauty, the cycle will return. We know that Jesus went to the grave, but he rose victorious so that we could live a life victorious, free from sin. Lord, help us to realize that, to realize the power of your spirit to imitate Christ because we have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So it's nice to have examples of people that imitate Christ. Paul tells us to imitate him because he lives as one that imitates Christ. And we're going to look at that some today. Because we're redeemed. We don't have to live the same way. We're supposed to live a life by faith. We're empowered by the Spirit. But without seeing some examples, it's kind of hard to understand that. We have Jesus Christ, of course, but we know that we can't live like Jesus Christ. But when we see other people that are living a worthwhile life, it gives us an incentive, it gives us inspiration, it gives us a pattern to look after. <clears throat> and Paul, if you notice in this letter, addressed the church in Corinth basically like he did the church in Romans, if you're following with us on Sunday night. And if you're not, please come. We'll invite you again. So we're going to look at Paul a little bit more today. What drives him, what motivates him, what he sees because he sees himself as redeemed. Even though the world may tell him other things, he knows that he has been redeemed. He knows he's a child of God. He's an apostle set forth for the gospel message. And he's trying his best to tell these churches, this is what you are also. Look at me. Be inspired. Don't worry about the things of this world. If you have issues, we will address those issues. If your faith is, is outstanding like the church in Romans are, we're going to encourage each other so we can grow stronger in our faith. <clears throat> in the scripture Paul read this morning, Paul introduced himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God in verse 1. 
It is God's will and His plan that salvation comes through Jesus Christ and no other. And we, as Christians, if you know the Lord, are a part of that. We are privileged, honored to be able to tell others about Jesus Christ. It's not a duty or an obligation. It's a privilege that we have to tell others. So he's writing to the church in Corinth, and he says in verse 2, "...to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be His holy people." Now you may remember from in Romans, I said the ver words to be shouldn't be there. The uh, translator put them in to make it a better read, so we don't see them in some of the translations. Those words were added. But I think it's so significant because Paul again is saying here, you're not called to be His holy people, you are His holy people. And he's writing these to the church in Corinth as we read on in the letter that we find out, whoa, they're doing some pretty terrible things in the church. But guess what? Even in their sin and shame, they're still covered by the blood of the Lamb. Because when you've been redeemed, you are covered. Your sins are passed as far as the east is from the west. And we talked about that last week. Why is it not north to south? Or south to north? Because you can go so far north and then you start going south, don't you? Wouldn't work. But east to west, if you travel east, you will always go east and east and east and east and east. You will never head west. You will continue in an easterly pattern. And that's how far your sins are set apart from you. They will no longer ever be looked at because you're clothed by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Wow, you are a saint, not an ain't. You're redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, called, set apart, holy, sanctified, set apart for the gospel of Jesus Christ to be different from the world so that your light can shine and you can tell others about Jesus Christ and draw them to the love of God the Father. <coughs> To those who are sanctified, to God's holy people, those who are righteous because of their faith, not because of anything they've done, because we have two totally different churches here. One whose faith is being heard of all over the world, who an apostle had not even come to. The church had started on its own from people that had gone back to Rome. And we have a church that Paul had visited already and talked with them and spent time with them. And yet, here they are falling into sin and shame again, which they don't need to because they are no longer a slave to that. But he, he addresses both of them the same way. You are holy, you are sanctified, you are set apart. Because once you're saved, that's who you are in Jesus Christ. Romans 1.1 1, 1 said, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. You can see a very similar introduction. Dropping down to verse 5 through 7, it says, Through Him we receive grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to obedience that comes from faith for His name's sake. Paul is trying to bring about their growth of faith, which will produce more obedience. And you also are among those Gentiles who are called to belong to Christ Jesus, to all in Rome who are loved by God and called His holy people, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. And if you look at, at the Corinthians, we see grace and peace also. Because as a Christian, that's what you should have. No matter your circumstances, no matter whether you're sick, no matter whether you're persecuted, no matter whether you're in need, no matter whether you're, you have plenty, you have grace and peace. And you're working towards a hope, the salvation of your souls which is guaranteed to you and sealed by the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> These churches were totally different, but yet Paul addressed them as the same. They're saved. They're sanctified. They're set apart. God does not view you as a sinner that you were, but views you through the righteousness of Jesus. See, Paul understood this, and that's what motivated him and gave him the drive and the ambition to tell other people about Jesus Christ, to deliver the good news of the gospel message that salvation had come. The kingdom of God was at hand. Paul calls himself a servant, an apostle, set apart for the gospel of Jesus. And he calls both churches called, set apart, holy, sanctified, and saints. Because that's what we are. I can't say it enough. 
Because if you realize who you are, then that's the first step in realizing that the devil has no power over you. That you are God's child. That you have the power of God residing in you. That the victory has already been won. Because see, Satan is a deceiver. He's been a deceiver from day one. He's the father of all lies. And he wants to tell you that you're worthless, you're weak, you're nothing. You're not nothing because Jesus Christ, God's Son, died for you. You are something indeed. And it's not ever going to change because you belong to God. <clears throat> the inspiration here is that we see two different groups of people. And like I said, the status is still the same. They are still God's children. If you have more than one child... One of them may have been the best behaving in the world and the other one may have been the worst, but you still love them, don't you? Because they are your child and that won't change. If we read on in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, we get down to verse 16 and it says, Therefore I urge you to imitate me. Because Paul is giving us a real live human example, not the Son of God that, that we can see changed. And Paul is the perfect example. Because he was the most rotten scoundrel there was, feared by men, he's going to be persecuted and everything else, but he stands firm in his faith, led by the Spirit of God. Jesus, of course, is our one perfect example. So he says to imitate me as I imitate Christ. Well, Paul calls himself an apostle. So what does that mean? It's from the Greek word apostolos. If you start studying that, you're going to get all kind of different ideas. Okay, so right now I'm going to give you my idea, and I always explain that because you may not agree with me, and that's fine if you don't. But simply an apostle means to be sent. And Paul said that to, the Spirit gives to some apostles. If you read a lot of, of um, sources of today's knowledge, you'll see that a lot of people say that apostles don't exist anymore. But if you look at, the ver at what it means, apostles simply mean to be sent. There's a difference in how the word is used. The word is used quite frequently for the twelve apostles. So I call that apostles with a capital A. But scripture also refers to apostles with a small a. That's my terminology. And that means that people are sent. The NIV um, translate that word as messengers when it's not to anybody. Paul says there are different apostles. He calls Barnabas one and others. So someone who is sent, in my opinion, is an apostle, small a. But like I said, if you research it, you'll find some discrepancy there, and, and some people will say that apostles don't exist today. So there's my difference. Take it and go with it. If you want to talk to me more about it, we will. But I don't want to teach heresy or anything like that. I want you to know what the word means. The word means to be sent. And all of God's children are sent to spread the gospel message. And the reason I say that is because if we don't realize it, say, oh, the apostles don't exist anymore, then we might not think that we're sent. God is sovereign. He knows exactly when you were going to be born. He knows exactly where you're at today. I'm proof of that. Who would ever thought I'd be in northern Idaho? I was born in North Carolina, raised in Tallahassee, Florida. And I'm in northern Idaho now, and I'm pastoring a church, which I said, I will not pastor a church, Lord. Call me to anything else, but I don't want to be a pastor. And here I am. God knew exactly what He had planned. Now, I have to be obedient to that or not, and I don't know His will all the way, and we're going to see that with Paul today. Because he longed to see the Romans. He wrote the letter to the Romans and it was five years or more before he actually got to come visit them. And he didn't come visit them as a free man, but as a, as a captive in chains. I don't think that's the way Paul envisioned it. But he walked by the Spirit no matter what he faced in life. And that's what's so amazing about looking at him as an example. <clears throat> John 20, 21 says, Again Jesus said, Peace be with you. As my Father has sent me, I am sending you. That's not a call to the twelve. That's a call to each and every one of us. Maybe you're being obedient to exactly what God's calling you. Maybe you're not. 
but He knows where you're at and He has placed you there as a witness. You can reach people that I can't reach, that other people can't reach, that Jacob can't reach, Merle can't reach, whoever it is, because you're in a situation where you're friends with them. You live in this neighborhood. You're at this job or whatever. God has sent you to that ministry to witness and tell others of Jesus Christ, of what has changed you, of the grace that was greater than all of our sins. So we are called and sent. We are sanctified and set free. So I apply that term with a small a to each and every believer. There's where, like I said, I may differ from what other people say apostles are. But we are called, that's simply what the word, or we are sent, that's simply what the word means. And that's exactly what Paul did. Matthew and Mark use the word only once, and they use it in reference to the twelve apostles. Luke uses it for the first time in Luke 6.13. It says, When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose, and this is Jesus, and chose twelve of them, who he also designated, named, or called apostles. Why, if you read the scripture there? Because he was sending them out. We do read that there are twelve apostles. We do read that, that they'll be on the twelve pillars in the, in the New Jerusalem. But the word apostle itself means sent, and each and every one of us is sent. <clears throat> Jesus washed his disciples' feet, and he tells them to follow his example. As I have done for you, you should do for the world. Because if we don't live a life differently, then people aren't going to know. And then if we don't tell them, how are they going to know? They can see your actions because you're a good person. You do everything great. But if, they don't, if you don't say that Jesus is the reason, then they're going to think good is good enough to get to heaven. Good people go to hell. Saved people go to heaven. There's one way, one truth, and one life, and that's through Jesus Christ. John 3.16 says, 13.16 says, Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his, messenger, no, than his master, nor is a messenger, apostolus, he that is sent, greater than the one who sent him. We have a mission, and we have a big mission field in the world today. Because the world today says God doesn't matter. God doesn't exist anymore. There's many ways to, to get to God. Whatever the things, things are, they need our lights to stand up and shine and say, no, there's one way, Jesus Christ, let me tell you about Him. And we need to live a life that they'll, they'll, they'll see that in us, not a life of hypocrisy. Jesus sent His apostles out to spread the good news. You may have heard of the Great Commission before, right? It's what we're called to do. Starting in verse 16 of Matthew 28, it says, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. Then they saw, when they saw Him, they worshipped Him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Me. Therefore, go. That's sending, isn't it? And make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Now, how are you going to teach them to obey everything that He's commanded if you're not doing it yourself? Right? And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Well, how can He say that? He's going to leave. He can say that because He's going to send back the promised Spirit. God lives with us, inside of us, empowering us, directing us, protecting us, counseling us every single minute of every single day. But what I want to point out here, Jesus told them to go. It says, when they saw Him, they worshipped Him, but some doubted. See, that's normal. Don't beat yourself up for that. That's human nature. Paul doubted, but he still was led by the power of the Spirit. That's what makes the difference is the Spirit-filled life. And as we read on in Romans, we'll see more and more about that. In Mark chapter 16, verse 14 through 16, it says, Later Jesus appeared to the leaven. As they were eating, He rebuked them for their lack of faith. This was the eleven that, that doubted. Some 
uh, commentaries, when you read it, say it wasn't the 11 that doubted, it was the other disciples that were there. No, it's the 11 that doubted. They doubted because they were human beings. They didn't, you didn't see a changed individual until the Holy Spirit came. And then you saw, we're studying Peter in um, Sunday school class. And you'll see the person that denied Jesus said, I'll never deny you, but denied him three times. Then be the first one to get up at Pentecost once he was empowered by the Spirit and boldly proclaim Jesus Christ. If you look, his message was nothing extravagant either. It was, it was what Jesus came to do. That Jesus came. He was sent by God. That he died for our sins and rose again on the third day. And people came to Christ in groves because of the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what changes a man. What transforms a man. That's what gives us the power to do what we think that we can never do on our own. And we can never do it on our own. We're right. <clears throat> To finish out that verse, it says, For their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe. Stubborn, not just refusal, but stubborn refusal to believe. Those who had seen him after he had risen, he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. That sending again, that command to go and spread the gospel, that privilege to spread the gospel message to the world. Whosoever believes and baptized will be saved, but whosoever does not believe will be condemned. We have such a responsibility, but such a privilege also. We're not capable on our own. We don't have the power to fight the devil. We don't have the strength or the faith that we need until we rely on the power of the Spirit of God inside of us. <clears throat> and that's why Jesus closed out the Great Commission with, And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. That's what gives us the hope. The promised Holy Spirit makes all the difference in the world. Merle and I were talking Sunday after um, Bible study. And this is what got me to thinking about this and stuff. Because it's a thought that I've had quite often. And what we were talking about is, how do we know that our faith will be strong enough if and when that day of persecution comes. Because this world looks like it's changing. Looks like that we may be persecuted for our faith even in this country. We see pictures of martyrs in other countries and stuff and we see them with a bag over their head or whatever it is and saying, denounce Christ. How do they have that kind of faith? I don't think I could have that kind of faith. But I'll tell you how you can have that kind of faith. Walk in that faith daily. If you walk by the Spirit of God, you will die with the Spirit of God. He is what will empower you to walk through anything in your life, including a persecuted death. Hopefully, we'll never have to face that. But it's something that I do think about quite often. How could I, how could I ever be able to stand firm in that point in my life? It's simple. I won't be able to. But with the power of the Holy Spirit, I will walk through it because the Spirit will come in. The Scriptures even say that when we don't know what to pray for, that the Spirit prays for us. He cries out for us. That's the power that we have to face anything and everything in our life. So I know exactly what Paul meant when he said in Philippians 4.13, 4, I can do all things through Him that gives me strength. You see this verse quite often on a t-shirt for a marathon or something. It's not about a sporting event. It's not about a diet you're going on. It's about the spiritual warfare that you'll face in your life. That through the power of the Spirit, knowing Christ, I can have strength to face anything and everything in life. Because victory has already been won through Jesus. Looking back at verse 12... It says, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret, because it's been revealed to you. It's not a secret anymore. The mysteries of God have been revealed through His Spirit. The secret of being content in any and every situation, including that persecution to death. And we see that in the disciples' lives. Whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want or suffering need, I can do all this, all things, 
through and in Him, Christ, who gives me strength or who strengthens me. A power that only comes from the Spirit of God, from His revelation of Jesus Christ. The same Spirit that guided Jesus through His ministry. The same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. The same Spirit that binds us together that every believer has. John 15, verses 4 and 5 read, Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. We can't rely on our own strength. We can't walk this world by sight rather than by faith. We can't not realize that this is a spiritual battle. There is much more to play at play than just our momentary life on this world and the things we face. The things we do have eternal consequences. Paul knew this. If you walk daily in faith, you will die in faith. The Holy Spirit will empower you all the way. He won't forsake you at the end. He'll give you more power than you ever dreamed of. So when, when Saul encountered the Lord in Acts 22, verse 10, he said, What shall I do, Lord? And he did that. He didn't just say that and, and walk away from it. He said, What shall I do, Lord? And it changed everything. He was obedient. And that's what he's trying to tell the Romans as we study that, that book. He began to live a life empowered by the Spirit of God. Reading on in Acts 22, The Lord answered, so when you say, what shall I do, Lord? Don't walk away and not get the answer. Listen. It may be in a whisper. It may be obvious. But listen for that answer. And the Lord said here, get up. The Lord said, and go into Damascus. There you will be told what you have been assigned to do. God has an assignment for each and every one of us. And it is a daily walk where we deny ourselves daily, take up our cross, and follow Him. Today it may be to witness to my neighbor down the road. Tomorrow it may be to rest. The next day it may be to do something else. But we need to follow the power of the Spirit to, to tell what our assignments are in front of us. <clears throat> my companions, verse 11, led me by the hand into Damascus because the brilliance of the light had blinded me. A man named Ananias, Ananias came to see me. He was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all Jews living there. He stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment I was able to see. Then he said, The God of our ancestors has chosen you to know His will and to see the righteous one and to hear words from His mouth. You will be His witness to all people of what you have seen and heard. Now let's look at Ananias for just a second. Who was he? He was another one that was sent, wasn't he? He was another one that was sanctified and made holy by the blood of Jesus. If you go back to Acts 9, verse 10, it says, In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. Same way, Lord, he knew who this was. The Lord told him, he listened for that answer, Go! to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hand on him to restore his sight. Verse 13. Lord, Ananias answered, are you sure this is what you want me to do? I'm doubting, I'm fearing, because I'm a man and I don't understand. I've had the Spirit, I know what you said, I know that you're Lord, but I still doubt. That's normal. But that's when you draw upon the power of the Spirit to get you past that. Because he feared what would happen if he went to see Paul. But as we read on, we'll see that he was obedient. I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go. Now mine has a go with an exclamation point. Okay? Because God got a little firmer. I've told you once. I shouldn't have to tell you twice. Go! And Ananias obeyed. 
This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. He didn't ask any more questions at that point. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may uh, <clears throat> see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. Now when he was baptized with the Holy Spirit here, he was completely filled to the brim. He had everything that he needed. He may not have drawn upon the power at this point yet because that's a different thing, learning how to draw on the power of the Spirit. But each and every believer is filled to capacity with the Spirit. If you remember from reading from Acts, when we're first introduced to Saul, it's, he is addressed as Saul, but he has already been converted. It's in Acts chapter 13. That's four chapters after Acts 9, right? And we read in verse 9, Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elymas and said... So from chapters 9 to chapter 13, if you look, you'll see Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas and Saul. Because Barnabas was the main character, with the one with the most faith, being led the most by the Holy Spirit. Until this verse, when Paul gets it, and then we don't read any more about Barnabas anymore. And we also don't read any more about Saul. It's Paul from this point out. Because when Paul realizes the power of the Spirit, then you see that changed man. You see someone totally different, just like Peter. Jesus changed Cephas' name to Peter. But we see Peter as a man of failure until he truly realizes the power of the Spirit of God. And from that point on, he is a mighty warrior for God. He doesn't worry about what happens anymore. He doesn't deny Christ anymore. And see, each and every one of us is changed when we receive the Spirit of God in us. We have the power to undergo whatever it is. <clears throat> if you read on in Acts, and I'm going to briefly just tell you, you can see the examples, and I'm going to challenge you to go home and read it, starting in Acts chapter 22 you'll see what happens in Paul's life. He's written his letter already to the Romans. He's longing to see them. He says, I'm going to be coming to you shortly. But this is what happens to him during that point. At the <clears throat> end of or verse 22 of chapter 22, it says, Then they raised their voices and shouted, Rid the earth of him. He is not fit to live. The Jews set out on a mission to kill Paul, to get rid of him. Because he was one that agreed with them, that did everything they said. Now he's changed. He's, he's the most treacherous thing to them. He's a traitor. Because now he's proclaiming this Jesus that they set out to destroy. Chapter, three, chapter 23, verse 9 says, There was a great uproar. Verse 10 says, The dispute became so violent that the commander was afraid Paul would be torn to pieces by them. He ordered the troops to go down and take him away from them by force and bring him into the barracks. But see, God does not leave you alone. He's right there beside you all the way. Verse 11, The following night the Lord stood near Paul. The Lord's there all the time. But what that means is that the Lord came close to Paul so Paul would realize the comfort of the Lord. He was there all the time, but he reached out and touched him and said, Paul, take courage. As you have testified about me in Jerusalem, you must also testify in Rome. So Paul's going to Rome, isn't he? He's going to go to Rome just like he knew that God was leading him to go to Rome when he wrote that letter roughly a year ago. But he's not going to see this at all. He's going to have to walk by faith, not by sight. Because if he walks by sight, he's never going to believe God's words here. Because as we read on... <clears throat> The Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves with an oath not to eat or drink until they had killed Paul. But God delivered him. Chapter 24. As Paul, in verse 25, says, As Paul talked about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid. He's been handed over to Governor Felix now for protection. He's still in chains. He's still a prisoner. That's enough for now, Felix said. You may leave. When I find it convenient, I will send for you. 
At the same time, he was hoping that Paul would offer him a bribe, so he sent him frequently and talked with him. When two years passed, two years of being in prison, two years of the Jews trying to kill me, two years of just sitting in a cell, but I, he's still talking about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. I kind of would think I might not be making it to Rome, wouldn't you by now? But he's going to because God promised that. He's walking by faith, not by sight. Then Felix was succeeded by Festus. But because Felix wanted to grant a favor to the Jews, he left Paul in prison. Chapter 25, Paul is still in custody. The Jews are still plotting to kill him after two years. Verse 11 says, If however I am guilty of doing anything deserving death, I do not refuse to die. Paul is still submissive to authority, even though he knows he's done nothing wrong. He makes his appeal to Caesar. and He says, Off to Caesar you will go. Then King Agrippa comes on the stage. Who is King Agrippa? He's the grandson of Herod the Great that killed all the babies trying to get rid of Jesus. He's also related to Herod that beheaded John the Baptist. I don't think I'd be talking to this man about Jesus, do you? Not Paul. He talks to him about Jesus. <clears throat> Verse 14, Since they were spending many days there, Festus discussed Paul's case with the king. Verse 18, When his accusers got up to speak, they did not charge him with any of the crimes that I had expected. Instead, they had some point of dispute with him about their own religion, about a dead man named Jesus who Paul claimed was alive. Paul still preaching about Jesus. Verse 22, Then Agrippa said to Festus, I'd like to hear this man myself. <laughs> Paul's going to get to preach to the king. God has a plan. Can you see all this? If we're walking by sight, not by faith, we would have no clue. Chapter 26, Paul gets to, to talk with Agrippa. And he tells him about his conversion. In verse 15 it says, Then I ask, Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. Now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a service, servant and as a witness of what you have seen of me and will see of me. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them. Paul's not worried because he trusts God. He is sending them to, in verse 18 says, to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light. That's what we get to take privilege and part in. So that maybe one day when we're in heaven, somebody comes up and says to us, Hey, brother, you remember when you did this and said this? I came to Jesus. I don't think the fishing trips or the toys we have or anything else will matter at that point. I think it will all come to perspective. Hopefully it will come to perspective for us before then. To turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to the power of God. If you have the power of God, then the power of Satan is nothing anymore, isn't it? So that they may receive forgiveness of sin and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven. That's exactly what he did, was what God told him to do. Goes on and says, verse 22, But God has helped me to this very day. Verse 25, Festus yells out, or verse 24, Festus yells out and says, At this point, Festus interrupted Paul's defense. You are out of your mind, Paul. Not everyone's going to believe us. We're going to be persecuted. Paul replied, what I am saying is true and reasonable. Verse 26, the king is familiar with these things. <laughs> this is a man who could easily just have his head cut off like has been done in the past. But instead, he boldly preaches to him and says, you're familiar with these things, aren't you, king? They weren't done in secrecy. You've heard of this man named Jesus. Don't you want to believe? Wow, what, a, what an example we have. Verse 27 says, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. Then Agrippa said to Paul, Do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Paul's reply, you got to love it. Short time or long, I pray to God that, only, that not only you, but all who listen to me today, what if he wouldn't have preached the words, may become what I am except for these chains he's still bound, still a prisoner, still preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
Verse 27, I mean, chapter 27, he sets off for Rome. What happens? He gets shipwrecked. He's still not going to make it there. Paul 28, I mean, chapter 28, Paul is on the island there. When he gets on the island, he gets bit by a poisonous viper. What else could go wrong? How could God be in control of this situation? How am I ever going to make it to Rome? Because God said so. God said, you're going to preach in Rome. You're going to be my servant. You're going to bring the gospel message there. And Paul realized this, so he walked by faith, not by sight. He's still a prisoner in chains. Verse 30, it says, For two years Paul stayed there in his own rented house. This is when he gets to Rome. He's still in chains. But he welcomed all who came to see him. Verse 31, He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. It doesn't matter if you're in chains and shackles in this world. It doesn't matter if you're bitten by poisonous snakes, if people are out to kill you. What matters is that you're obedient to Jesus Christ. So when Paul says, imitate me, this is what he's talking about. So I challenge you to go read those because I just sped read through them. Read them with, with a desire to learn and look and see what Paul was trying to get across to these Christians in Rome. I've heard about your faith all over the world. You're inspiring me. Wow, they're inspiring this man? And look at what we have as an example. So Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4, 16, Therefore I urge you to imitate me. I said before that Acts kind of ends kind of abruptly because we don't see anything else. That's because the Acts of the Apostles, small a, not big A, because we're not the twelve, are continuing on. We are the ones that are sent. We have a story to tell. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. We're going to sing one more song. And I don't know why I'm helping because my voice is not much better. <clears throat> but it's called, I Belong to God. Some of the words are, no longer bound by fear, no longer found in shame. Here we are now, children of a mighty God. We have been marked, marked by grace. We have been called by name. Here we are now, children of a mighty God, a mighty God. And the chorus is, I belong to Jesus, I belong to Jesus. Saved by your power and bought with your blood. I'll say it to the darkness, you don't own me anymore. Oh, oh, I belong to God. And my prayer is that you realize the power of God as Paul did and you imitate him as he imitates Christ. If you'll stand, we'll sing this last song. No longer bound by fear No longer found in shame here we are now, children of a mighty God. We have been marked, marked by grace. We have been called by name. Here we are now, children of a mighty God. A mighty God, I belong to God, I belong to Jesus, saved by your power and bought with your blood. I'll say to the darkness, you do not own me anymore, oh, I belong to God, oh. I belong to God We look upon your scars We see a God who heals Here we are now Children of a mighty God Written in red, in red for us Your everlasting love 
here we are now children of a mighty god a mighty god i belong to god i belong to jesus saved by your power and bought with your blood i'll say to the darkness you do not own me anymore oh, i belong to god oh, 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 oh i belong to god i am defined by your heart for me i am defined by the power of your cross i'm so alive with your life in me now everything within me knows that i belong to god i belong to jesus saved by your power and bought with your blood I'll say to the darkness, you do not own me anymore. Oh, I belong to God. I belong to God. I belong to Jesus. Saved by your power and bought with your blood. I'll say to the darkness, you do not own me anymore. Oh, I belong to God. Oh, I belong to God. Oh, I belong to God. For you are the for you are all sons of light and sons of the day. We do not belong to the night or the darkness. So then, we must not sleep like the rest, but we must stay awake and be serious. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, we must be serious and put the armor of faith and love on our chest and put, a helmet of hope on a, and put on a helmet of the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to the wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up as you are already doing.